Hello, everyone, and welcome to Live Academy, the virtual design learning platform by Meal Middle East Architecture Lab. My name is Riyad Jokha. I'm logging in from Dubai, and I'll be moderating today's public lecture given by Ronald Ryle of Ryle San Fratello. As with every week on Live Academy, we start the week, and the week here starts on Sunday. We start the week with a public lecture that's open to all, uh, from, given by an architect that we uh, love, respect, and admire, uh, sharing their work and discourse on our platform. This presentation will be broadcasted or is broadcasted on YouTube Live as we speak and will be uh, uploaded on our YouTube channel. So make sure that you subscribe to that channel and uh, watch the other lectures that have been launched. We also have uh, a series of technical classes coming up for this semester that you can check out on uh, the links that the host will post in the chat. I became familiar with the work of uh, Ronald Ryle first through the experiments he did with emerging objects and later by scaling these interesting 3D printing processes to projects that have environmental and political impacts. I'm very grateful that and honored that he agreed to share with us some of his, his work and discourse on uh, Live Academy today. Uh, for 18 years, uh, Ryle Sanfratello has attempted to rethink the art and practice of designing and constructing buildings. The studio's desires for an ecological practice come from indigenous and traditional knowledge base and not from contemporary trends in the profession. And I find that to be particularly interesting, this juxtaposition of uh, tradition, culture, and heritage with uh, avant-garde technologies, um, not taking just a trend of uh, a certain technology as a starting point for a project, but rather taking uh, the, the culture, the heritage as a starting point, materiality, and uh, sort of taking advantage of, uh, you know, some of the uh, facilities given by technologies to come up with something new and brilliant. Professor uh, Ronald Ryle holds the Eva Lee Memorial Chair in Architecture and a Joint Appointment at the Department of Architecture in the College of Environmental Design and the Department of Art Practice. He is both uh, a Bakar and Hellman uh, Fellow, Director of the Masters of Architecture Program, and founded the Print Farm Laboratory, a print facility for architecture research and materials. His research interests connect indigenous and traditional material practices to contemporary technologies and issues, and he is a design activist uh, an author, a thought leader with the topics of additive manufacturing, uh, border wall studies, and earthen architecture. In 2014, his creative practice, Rael Sanfratello, with architect Virginia Sanfratello, was named an emerging voice by the Architectural League of New York, one of the most coveted awards in North American architecture. In 2016, Rael Sanfratello was also awarded the Digital uh, Practice Award of Excellence by the Association of Computer Aided Design in Architecture. Acadia. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Ronald Rael of Rael Santatello to Live Academy to his pu uh, public lecture on our platform. Uh, thank you so much for making it, Ronald. Thanks for that great introduction. I will start by sharing my screen. And you did touch upon many of the, uh, the various ways that we work through various practices that we have. Um, I'm going to be focusing this lecture on our studio emerging objects and tell you a little bit about the research we've been doing in additive manufacturing over the last uh, 12 or 13 years now. Um, so not, you can find more information at railsanfratello.com, emergingobjects.com or at my Instagram, rrail. Uh, but speaking about emerging objects, I mean, fundamentally, we have this idea about uh, 3D printing at larger scales and big ideas around 3D printing. Um, and there are three, there are four basic tenets to what we do. We invent materials for 3D printing that are affordable and strong and come from waste stream or localized sustainable sources. We create assembly methods that do not require specialized skill. Uh, we create platforms for software and hardware that place additive manufacturing within reach. And we consider the connection between pre-industrial, industrial, and digital craft technologies. And what I mean by that connection between pre-industrial, industrial, and digital craft technologies is this. We have been very inspired by our own traditions of building out of mud, of earth, uh, fundamentally building blocks, bricks. And the fact uh, is that the very house that I'm coming to you all right now is a house made out of mud and made out of bricks that was made out of my great made, made by my great grandfather um, about eight years ago or so i published a book called earth's architecture and what this book did is it looked at the contemporary history of building in earth how earth could be a modern material 
but I was also interested in the future of earth and architecture and how, you know, what is, what is the, how can we use this not as a, as a modern material, but what happens in the future? And I thought that 3D printing might be the way that we engage this material uh, <clears throat> in the future. And so I'm gonna take you a little bit on my journey of trying to aspire and reach this goal of 3D printing using earthen technologies that has been almost a decade long project. Uh, and it starts here with this very simple technology that I think everyone knows, which is the common 3D printer made out of plastic. And so many of our early experiments were experimenting with these plastic based 3D printers. Uh, but we were wondering what 3D printing architecture meant for the 21st century and how we could incorporate craft and material origins, but also this idea of a print farm. In other words, that rather than thinking of one large machine that was bigger than the object that it printed itself, how we could have a battery of machines that pr printed a number of parts, in this case, a number of bricks to assemble large scale objects. And so some of our early experiments were simply experimenting with the idea of the brick. The idea of a brick is that anyone could assemble this. And so some of our earliest experiments involved our child and making toys that were bricks to build walls using very simple methods. And in these experiments from about eight years ago, we developed bricks that in this case had two holes, three holes and four holes, and they could be rotated in any direction and they could be attached with a simple 3D printed assembly system to make these complex structures that revealed the mathematics behind them, but also the beauty and the transparency and translucency of the material itself. Uh, we took these projects further exploring how we could not only uh, manufacture straight walls, but manufacture uh, walls that were doubly curved surface and make entire enclosures. So every one of our projects is a research project that explores a few different topics. And if that previous one was how to assemble very quickly and rapidly using a battery of 3D printers, this project took that further where we had the opportunity to use a battery of 100 3D printers to print uh, this doubly curved enclosed surface. <clears throat> but one of the common uh, conceptions about 3D printers is that uh, 3D printers do not care about complexity. And so you can print uh, a thousand different parts and the 3D printer doesn't care. And while that's true, the human who's operating that 3D printer and has to sort through those files does care. And so what's the minimum number of parts that one could, uh, could use to make a doubly uh, curved surface and enclosure? And so we designed this so it would be comprised of about 54 unique parts. That way, file management was kept as a minimum. And actually, the, the color coding of these, while having an aesthetic, which might look like uh, a Muslim mosque or an American quilt, uh, is actually the instructions, the mathematical instructions built into the facade itself. So you would know exactly where a purple piece went, or a white piece, or a red piece would go based on uh, an image and pattern. And of course, <clears throat> we are always interested in the, the kind of latent uh, political and cultural meanings behind this work, but also the phenomena of the material itself, uh, the translucency, the transparency, um, to make these structures very quickly, but also what they mean in terms of thinking about a future of 3D printed architecture. So in this case, these smaller blocks were assembled into larger pieces, and then those larger pieces were assembled all together quite rapidly. And so uh, this was all delivered from California via an email to uh, the MakerBot uh, factory in um, New York, uh, and assembled by people who had never assembled anything before. And uh, within a few hours, they were able to assemble this structure. That project's called the Star Lounge. Our other experiments were about taking control of the way the robot uh, deposited material. And this was an extremely innovative set of experiments because it allowed us to control thickness, uh, for structure, but also the aesthetic properties of the material as well. And so it's really nice to see that um, six or seven years after doing these initial experiments that many people have taken on these kind of uh, projects and 
expanding this this knowledge base even further. But we call this project G Code PLA or G Code Play, uh, partly because much of our research involves play, uh, literal play. We think of our studio as a playground in which we're inventing and exploring the possibilities of the tools that we're using, in this case, added manufacturing tools, and thinking about how we can discover new directions for them, new ways to think about a material, taking a material like plastic and turning it into something far more special by the way we're simply depositing it, denying the, the layering that 3D printing usually has, layer by layer, and this time making it much more like a weave, much more like a textile. And here are just some images of some of those early experiments and, and projects. <clears throat> but while plastic was ubiquitous in 3D printing for a number of years, uh, and most of our plastics were using PLA made out of uh, recycled corn or uh, other waste agricultural materials, we wanted to think about what other materials might be available for 3D printing. And we embarked on a series of projects that explored uh, materials that you can find just in the landscape, just anywhere near around you in the same way that Adobe bricks and mud was, is building from the landscape. What other materials are right around you? And uh, some of the early origins of the project just looked at the materials that we found in our house, like the coffee we threw away every day in the, in the morning and how we could use uh, the waste coffee grounds as a material for additive manufacturing. And so in <clears throat> the same way that we play with materials, we were playing with the objects themselves. So these are 3D printed coffee cups made out of three uh, out of coffee grounds. And if you need if you had coffee uh, cups, you would have to have a uh, sugar. And so we made spoons made out of 3D printed sugar. But what we did is when we made these spoons out of sugar is that we calibrated them to a teaspoon. And so this is exactly the amount of sugar of one teaspoon or half a teaspoon or a teaspoon and a half or two teaspoons. And so if we're making teaspoons out of sugar, we are wondering, well, could we make uh, teaspoons out of tea? And so these are 3D printed teaspoons made out of tea. Uh, and if you have teaspoons made out of tea, you probably need tea cups. And so these are 3D printed tea cups made out of tea. And this is uh, the coffee cups and tea cups and sugar spoons uh, made out of those various materials. But if you have tea cups, maybe you need a teapot. And so it's interesting the history of computer uh, aided design and computer graphics that one of the first objects ever translated from the physical world into a rendering in the computer was something called the Utah teapot or the Newell teapot. <clears throat> and this is it. And so we thought we would bring the Newell teapot back from the virtual world, the computational world, back into the physical world. So this is the Newell teapot uh, made out of tea. And this is the what we call the Utah tea set. Other recycled materials uh, in Northern California are grape skins. And so there's huge wine producing regions in Northern California above San Francisco. And the skins from those grapes are uh, an agricultural waste product. And so we embarked on a project to think about how we can use that waste project to derive an added manufacturing material. Um, and so these are uh, Chardonnay grape skins to make these Chardonnay grapeskin goblets. And then we worked on a really productive, beautiful collaboration with the architect Andrew Cudless, who I think has lectured on this platform as well. And so we used these additive manufacturing grapeskins to uh, design these series of objects uh, for Pierre Gerlet uh, that held, um, this is an ice chest for holding, uh, for holding wine. And we also collaborated with him uh, to create these tables uh, that use some of those G-code play um, techniques that we were developing at the time. So our ability to work in agricultural waste products allowed us to explore other products like paper. Um, <clears throat> and so in this case, we simply took ground a newspaper 
and this was with students at the University of California, Berkeley, to develop a material simply made out of paper. And while we've only printed some small projects based on this because it was quite difficult to grind the paper down into a, a fiber, we did see that it opened up the possibility for us to think about one of the largest waste products in the United States because wood construction is uh, by far one of the most standard traditions for residential construction in the United States. There are about 70 million tons of wood waste disposed of in the United States each year. And so how could we take what is fundamentally a subtractive industry? And what I mean by that is it begins with forests and it subtracts the trees from that forest and each tree is subtracted to make uh, lumber and timber. Uh, and ultimately that final product is, is tons of sawdust. How could we turn that into an additive industry uh, to make uh, potentially building components and objects? And so these are some of our early experiments taking sawdust and turning it into a 3D printable material. Uh, we also introduced fiber into that material to increase the strength. Um, beautifully, the layering process of additive manufacturing created almost these wood grains that returned the material back to its kind of origins of, of the kind of wood grain that you'll find in the growth rings of trees. It also had the capacity to explore certain properties that weren't natural, more un, un, unnatural material properties of being able to print at high thinnesses to have translucency, to create shapes that were really difficult to make. And we explored a number of different kinds of wood material from hardwoods to softwoods, even uh, nut uh, materials like crushed walnuts, for example, uh, to create these components, but always thinking again to this idea of the building block and how that building block might be aggregated together uh, to make assemblies and how those assemblies might come together to make what we would imagine would be uh, screens and walls and partitions and dividers and facades. And so just last year, we launched a, a company, we co-founded a company, my partner and I, along with uh, a person who long had a ceramic 3D printing company called Forest. And uh, Forest is a company that takes wood waste and 3D prints uh, architectural and interior elements. And so you can find more information about Forest at forest.io. Part of this is part of this company has a <clears throat> agenda about thinking about how not only we take waste material and turn it into valuable products, but how we can reduce the impact that the wood industry has on our forest. And so uh, we believe that, that the forests are really for us and we should preserve them and protect them in the future. So it's not only uh, materials made from agricultural materials or, or natural materials, but other materials that are synthetic and how we can recycle and upcycle those as well. So we did a project that explored how we can 3D print uh, tire rubber. And this is an image of Kuwait, which has one of the largest uh, tire landfills in the world, which can be seen from space. And in the United States, there are about 80 million tires disposed of each year. And so we wondered how we can take those tires and turn them into an added manufacturing material. And so we collaborated with a company that pulverized tires by uh, cryogenically freezing them, basically dipping them in liquid nitrogen and pulverizing them into a powder. So we've taken that powder and we've developed a 3D printable material using that powder. And so these are some of our early experiments of that. Um, this is one of the largest objects that we created called the, the rubber proof, uh, which is now part of the collection at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Other materials in the landscape in the Bay Area are salt. And if you've ever flown into the San Francisco Bay Area, you fly over these beautiful uh, salt ponds. Um, these are crystallization ponds that they fill with the salt water from the Bay. And over the course of the year, this evaporates and it produces uh, tons of salt and salt is a very inexpensive material and it's produced using only wind and sun. And so how could we take this material from the landscape and develop a 3D printable material and what are the consequences for that in the realm of architecture and, and interior design? And so these are, uh, we developed this material using salt which had beautiful translucent properties. Um, 
because it's so inexpensive, we begin to imagine what it meant to aggregate this material and think about how it might create building blocks or building facades. We collaborated on a project with Tom Falders, uh, uh, imagining a tower for Dubai, in fact. And so this is one of the models we produced for his studio made out of salt. Um, uh, in the Bay Area, <clears throat> the company that owns these salt crystallization ponds also develops much of this land for housing. So we simply took on an imaginary project thinking about what it would mean to involve the material of the landscape um, for the production of architecture itself. And so inspired by this idea again of how do you build from the landscape, in this case, taking the idea of the Inuit igloo, we begin a project called the Salt Igloo, a project made out of salt and glue. And uh, always looking at the traditions of the material itself, different salt harvesting practices. And this research was really to think about how we could make a structure as quickly as possible using the minimum number of materials and, uh, and, uh, and also the, the least number of machines. This was a, a project that we embarked on when actually we only had one machine in house. And so how quickly could we make uh, an object and so we worked with tiles that were fairly flat which each of them unique taking advantage of the 3d printer so there are several hundred of these unique salt tiles um, here's here's an example of two of them assembled together to create this salty glue which is very much like a lightweight salt tent held together in both tension and compression using lightweight aluminum rods here it's being assembled in our studio and Again, it takes on this idea of prefabrication. So it's been assembled and disassembled a number of times, in fact. Um, this is the interior of it. Uh, this is a, it is a museum, so it's traveled quite, quite frequently over the, the last uh, decade or so to various venues uh, because it can be assembled and disassembled quite quickly. Um, but again, we imagine this in the context of architecture. And so when we were invited to work on a project in Beijing, we imagined uh, salt being a material for the enclosures of the more private areas of the house, the bathrooms, the bedrooms, uh, the pool room outside, because we begin to work on ways that these materials had a longevity, that they were actually waterproof and durable, UV resistant. Uh, and this has allowed us to explore projects at much larger scales. Um, we collaborated with uh, one of the largest cement manufacturers in uh, Thailand um, to think about how we can make a material using cement. But whereas many companies around the world right now are thinking about how they could extrude a wet cement, our process is quite different. We're able to develop objects that do not require formwork and use very little water in contrast to the amounts of water that are needed for concrete production. Uh, we can print it very thin to make uh, literally translucent uh, cement. And while our product looks like concrete, um, it's extremely lightweight. It can be sanded and drilled and painted. And so it, it works in a very different way. It's, it's, almost, it's almost like a cement composite, um, like uh, modern kitchen countertops are made of, for example. But because it's so lightweight, we can make very large objects. In this case, an object held together simply with paper clips. Uh, working again with the architect Andrew Cudless, we produced a series of components for some of his projects. This one called the P ball. I think so demonstrating this idea that you can print a number of, of complex components without using any molding and put them together quite quickly. <clears throat> we're invited to develop a bench uh, in San Francisco to that was at the edge of this pier. And it was a year that in California, a particular sea slug was discovered. And we were fascinated by this beautiful pattern that the sea slug had on its back. So we called our project the seat slug. Uh, and it's a simple project of, of parametric design that ev everyone is familiar with. It wasn't really used back then for 3D printing because no one really had these kind of capabilities in 3D printing uh, that long ago, but we were able to question this idea of, of flatness and create uh, different objects. But 
uh, and different com uh, tiled components, let's say. But we were always concerned with this idea of design being a bottleneck. So rather than design uh, 100 different tiles, we would look back at tradition again and think about how we would take um, uh, Islamic tiling patterns or Japanese karakutsa tiling patterns and just simply design one tile that was rotated randomly and distributed along a surface. And so you can see that we can create a, a patterning system that does not replicate and when distributed along that surface, create an extremely complex surface um, that did not require any tooling, did not have any waste material and used very little water using cement and was highly structural. So these are the parts after they were printed and cured, they were held together with uh, hardware so they can be put together and assembled and, and assembled quite quickly. This is them being assembled in our studio. And this is the final seat slug from, uh, this is really one of the first things we've ever printed back in 2010, so 10 years ago, I think. Uh, <clears throat> And that launched us on a series of projects that just imagined how we would skip several steps in the architectural process, moving from a rendering directly to the manufacturer uh, without any drawings other than the file itself. So whereas architects have typically used 3D printers just to imagine the look and feel of a building and think about it at a different scale, we're using that exact same file to do the actual construction of the building itself. And so this is one of the largest cement structures that we've been able to experiment with and, and realize it's called Bloom. And while many of our, you know, as I mentioned, all of our, uh, our projects are our research projects that explore an idea. And this was again, thinking about that bottleneck of design that we want our printers to constantly be printing. We never want them to rest. And so well, how quickly can we design things? And this, this design was based simply on a black and white image and the black and white image told the structure where it should be open and where it should be closed. And therefore, we can imagine different forms, uh, and different images, and different phenomena being produced quite quickly using uh, simple algorithms. And so this is Bloom uh, installed <clears throat> in Northern California. Um, uh, there's an interior structure. Uh, you can see the old brutalist concrete building and the new 3D printed concrete building. Uh, again, all prefabricated into these larger panels uh, because the idea is that we could take this, construct it in the lab, test it, and move it to another site. And so here, just a quick look at just uh, a few of our uh, employees working together to assemble the project quite quickly. Um, and this idea of looking back at traditions, we're always thinking about how we're influenced by some of our experiences traveling the world and thinking about the, the, how we might impart a patterning technique to a building uh, in a new way and be inspired by some of the forms of, of traditional forms from our, from our uh, traveling research. But along this journey, the goal, as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, has always been to explore the use of clay as a building material and how we could take man's oldest additive manufacturing technology, uh, which has a 30,000 year old tradition and transform it in the 21st century. And so at that same time, uh, back in 2009 or so, we also begin to develop a clay material. And, and we've been working on it ever since. And it's been like a very slow evolution to think about how we could take clay and 3D printed. And so back in 2009, we developed a, a recipe for 3D printing in clay. And it took us on a journey to create 3D printed ceramics, which we had not really explored. Our vision was to think about how we could print buildings out of clay. But in fact, we began to print uh, ceramics because we wanted to test the precision and the accuracy and the delicacy of using 3D printing. Uh, and then we begin to think about, well, what is the ramifications for this in architecture? Do we make just a, a kind of dumb 3D printed brick that could hold uh, plants, for example, or that could create insulation because it has air pockets embedded in it? Or could we think about traditional uh, passive cooling systems? This is a passive cooling system that's still used throughout the world where you have a large porous ceramic vessel filled with water 
and placed near a window where hot, dry air moves over it, and it humidifies that air, thus lowering the temperature uh, within a room in an arid environment. And so taking all those components and embedding them into a single building unit, a, a brick, a cool brick, we call it, that has two levels of porosity. One level of porosity is micro porosity that's created by the 3D printing process and the material process that absorbs water like a sponge. So it's really beautiful how these bricks uh, hold an enormous amount of water inside of them. And a second layer of porosity that allows warm, dry air to move through them, thus humidifying the air. So this is our experiments in creating a cool brick. This relief you see allows much of the brick to be in shade during most of the day. And the matrix that creates this secondary perforation allows the bricks to hold uh, in mortar with a bit of tensile strength, which bricks normally do not have. Um, and so it's, it's handheld like a brick and be, can be assembled quite easily. And so that's the, that's the cool brick. Other experiments return to this idea like G-code play, but G-code clay. And we did not realize when we started this project about five or six years ago now, how much influence this project would have not only in the world of ceramic production, but in construction as well. And, and it was simply an experiment to think about how we could deposit this material in new ways um, to create objects that look like this or like this. Um, you can see where uh, just beginning to think about the plasticity of the material, the potential of, of the additive manufacturing process to do something that was not expected of the additive manufacturing process. And that was that 3D printing was intended to make the object that was designed in the computer. And this process was a series of glitches. We were playing with the material itself and thinking about how gravity and the wetness and its flexibility would create objects that really had never been seen before. Um, and we did not know really what they were good for, what their application was, but we were excited about the possibility of thinking about new textures and new forms and just new ways to envision a material process with a material that was uh, ecologically responsible, that was not uh, toxic, um, but also created these fantastic uh, patterns. And so each of these is just a sample of just different parameters of, of running the machine and the deposition of clay material and firing these ceramics. And we saved every single one that we, we ever made um, and then imagine the possibility for them to serve as an architecture, possibly a rain screen or facade system also held with the 3D printed components. Uh, imagining the potential uses of them as micro shading devices uh, and just their aesthetic properties. And so people often ask us when we lecture, well, how do you bring all this together? You're often thinking about different materials and they have different possibilities at different scales. Well, in some cases we bring them together by just bringing the different materials together. Um, and in some cases we've experimented our lab of ways of combining materials in different ways. So at the very top is 100% Chardonnay grape skin and the very bottom is 100% cement. And what does it mean to have a gradient between these agricultural and uh, geological materials. Again, playing, not knowing exactly what these are good for, but really interested in the possibility of these material hybrids. At the bottom is 100% cement. At the top is 100% curry. Uh, why? I don't know. It smells really great and beautiful when we're printing it, but it opens up the possibilities to new meanings for objects, uh, new effects and phenomena for our architecture, bringing in new kinds of sensorial phenomena. Um, some of this we got to explore uh, in Mumbai, working with Google and the Museum of Mumbai, uh, where they were celebrating, I think it was 10,000 years of ceramic tradition uh, in Mumbai. And Google had developed this app where someone would put in a word and a ceramic pot would be generated and have that word. And uh, then the, the most popular words would be archived in these ceramic objects on screen. But they invited us in to actually print the objects with the words on them 
for an exhibition that would occur 100 years from now, uh, creating these future, future relics, uh, if you will. And so we, we had this great pleasure to work with one of the most renowned ceramic artists of India, uh, who developed this local clay material for us. Uh, and some of the words were like book or plastic or computer or mobile phone. And we printed them uh, in, in English uh, and other indigenous uh, Indian languages um, on the objects themselves. So here you can see book written in two different languages on an object um, simultaneously on both sides. And then they were glazed and fired by the uh, local artist with whom we collaborated with creating these beautiful objects that will be on display uh, in 100 years. So if any of us are around then we'll have the opportunity to visit this, these future relics. Uh, other ways we've been combining this together is this project called Digital Hakal, uh, where we take local clays and we apply them to a 3D printed substrate. And so the substrate serves as a kind of lath that holds the clay material. And as the clay material dries, it creates a rigidity uh, giving the, uh, what is a very flexible structure, a kind of uh, uh, rigidity and, and structural quality to make an inhabitable uh, small environment. And so you can see this is it in its final form using local clay in France uh, attached to the 3D printed some structure. Um, other discoveries were, we were invited to print some scans of coral out of calcium carbonate. And this is what coral actually secrete. They secrete calcium carbonate. And this was to a demonstration project to show how increasing acidity levels uh, in oceans due to global warming is degrading the calcium carbonate of coral. This is not a project that was intended to save coral reefs, but just to use as a teaching device at, uh, at a museum to, to show how these uh, higher acidity levels degrade calcium carbonate. But when, when the um, California Academy of Sciences visited our studio and saw these experiments of G-code clay, they believed, uh, given their research showing that coral larvae uh, are quite attracted to ceramic substrates as a possible habitat in their lab that we could produce uh, habitat using 3D printed ceramics. And so we uh, worked with them for a number of months developing a series of designs using 3D printed ceramics for testing uh, for coral sea pod habitat all over the world uh, with an organization called Seacor, uh, which has a very interesting way of thinking about um, coral uh, habitat development uh, using the larvae itself as kind of seed pods. And so we 3D printed over 4,000 of these ceramic components that are now being tested uh, all over the world in Guam, Baja California, uh, Australia, Curaçao, uh, with, with a lot of promising success. And so we have this goal in the future, and I hope we begin to realize it, of 3D printed over 3D printing over a million of these ceramic components to be uh, tested all over the world to improve the lives of, uh, <clears throat> of coral reefs uh, around the world and, and that of the planet, of course. So it's not only animal habitat we're thinking of, of course, but the cabin of 3D printing curiosities is probably the biggest way that we've pulled all of this knowledge together. Uh, it is a cabin that takes advantage of a housing emergency in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, where the municipalities of what are, what are called the East Bay have relaxed their zoning requirements. So you no longer need an architect or go before the planning board to create a building up to 1,200 square feet in a backyard uh, in Oakland, California. And so here we printed this to explore the possibilities of 3D printing in a small detached dwelling. Uh, using over 4,000 ceramic cladding components that are um, <clears throat> that take advantage of our G-code play processes where every ceramic component is actually unique even though it is similar in the computer um, uh, using recycled clays from local ceramics laboratories and, and, and uh, facilities. 
the front facade of the cabin is made out of 3D printed cement, uh, 3D printed Chardonnay, 3D printed wood, um, and designed to hold succulents that grow very well in the Northern California climate. Uh, some of these tiles are actually made of a combination of all three of those materials. And so there's gradients of exploration that are happening on the surface. Um, <clears throat> the cabin is nestled in a, a fairly wooded uh, site, but the interior uh, is made out of um, uh, translucent PLA. And every single tile on the interior is, is different but it also the translucency allows the interior to um, present different moods, for example. And so there it's pink, here it's green, here it's uh, unlit. And so you can see the qualities of shade and shadow and light. We, we also explored 3D printing the furniture for the cabin, different chairs that take advantage of the G-code play uh, and other material processes. You can see a coffee cup made out of uh, 3D printed coffee grounds. Uh, some of our other examples. And uh, this is a house that at night looks like this. Uh, you can turn down to make a bed and the mood can transform, um, setting the tone for the, the house at different times of the day. So also combining this together, we're, we're thinking about how we can um, push this work together in, in different geographic areas, thinking about expanding beyond the borders of our laboratory and thinking about how we might <clears throat> push this work out into the context of, uh, in different contexts. Um, and so th there was a time when the, the, the leader of the current regime in the United States said that there were a lot of bad hombres at the US-Mexico border. And I happened to be at the US-Mexico border at that time. And I thought it was interesting, this idea of bad hombres. Um, and an hombre in art and design is actually this gradient between dark and light. And so on the left, I guess, is a bad hombre and on the right is a good hombre, uh, I don't know. Uh, but how can we begin to blend different material qualities and and think about the political ramifications of, of those materials. So we have clay at the bottom from the state of California and clay at the top from the state of Georgia. And we can see how these gradients mix and blend. Uh, and uh, we can see it at the object scale, but we can also see it at the scale of the detail. Uh, and thinking about what that means as a geography that might re represent a population. And because much of our work uh, involves working at the historic and contemporary border between the United States and Mexico, we had actually wondered how this project might work at the border between two countries. Um, and so we thought that it would be very exciting to take clay from Mexico and clay from the United States to create a series of objects. <clears throat> and so we worked with the University of Texas El Paso uh, professors there in ceramics, professors in geology, and about 25 ceramic artists from Juarez, Mexico and El Paso, Texas. And we gathered different clay samples from different sites in that region. And we discovered there was a beautiful range and complexion of clays from whites to browns to reds, even some greens. And we developed this application that ran in the cloud that we called Potterware and was a way for simply for ceramic artists to engage a 3D printer quite quickly without having to learn 3D printing modeling software like, like Rhino, for example, or Grasshopper, but they could use some of those same concepts of taking different parameters to shape an object. And so we created this application for those ceramic artists to use and we gave them a ceramic printer and we hoped that each one of them would produce at least one pot. Uh, and instead, they produced over 200 pots during the course of this project using clays from both countries. Um, and we call this project Mud Frontiers. Uh, and we, we like the idea of mud being an acronym for uh, mobility, ubiquity, and democracy to think about how we can just go out into the landscape and 3D print using local materials in a way that we envisioned back in 2008. And so imagining how we could scale this up. And to do that, we really needed to scale up both the, 
the, the, the material delivery, but also the hardware. And we were always interested in this idea of the farm, but in this case, could we develop a 3D printer that printed objects larger than the printer itself, rather than create a printer that was larger than the object itself? And so we sent this schematic design over to a company that was developing 3D printed uh, uh, ceramic 3D printers. And they decided that they would happily collaborate with us on taking that project further. So this was the, the, the printer that we co-developed using a very accessible SCARA type uh, robot arm, very inexpensive to make relative to a robot, but it could print many small objects, but also one very large object. And once we came to uh, a certain place in developing that technology, we realized we also had to think about how we can push enormous amounts of material through a 3D printed nozzle. Um, and so we continued that research and you know, in this idea of play, we came up with different kinds of forms and objects sometimes with successes and failures. This was kind of beautiful because we were using a, a, a pump that pulsated to push out the material and it created the kind of patterns that, you, that we produced when we were using the G-code play process. Uh, you can see the mud collapsing there, but eventually we got better and better at producing um, with a, a high degree of accuracy and speed. And so we took this project back out to the site, thinking about how we could take mud harvested directly from the landscape and uh, use a entirely new kind of 3D printer that was, that was lightweight and uh, making it portable, allowing us to go out into um, <clears throat> remote environments and 3D printing using the soil from the site itself. Here we're on a meso, we're looking at Juarez, Mexico. Um, and thinking about the possible textures that are created at one scale in pottery and at another scale using uh, mud that you know, weighs hundreds of pounds in this case. Um, so these are some of our first experiments. Then we took it back into the gallery to print the largest structure in mud that we had ever printed. Um, and then we took it out back into the landscape in this project called Mud Frontiers that for the first time explored some very large scale environments using 3D printed mud. And, and we conceptualized these projects under several themes. Uh, and I'll describe those themes in a, in a second, as you see, just a look at a little bit of our process. And we're not only printing the objects itself, but again, we're thinking about how do we print pottery from the landscape itself as well. And so I'm just gonna walk you through some of the themes that we explored. One was about lightness. Um, printing, uh, building in mud actually requires enormous amounts of mass. But in this case, we were able to take a small coil of mud and because we're undulating it, it creates a strength through this corrugation. But this lightness also allowed us to create these beacons of light out in the desert using solar powered, so solar powered LED lights. Uh, another theme was the beacon, um, the small platform uh, where we're exploring how we print circulation in, print stairs. Uh, <clears throat> the other was the kiln, where we fired pottery uh, using local wild clays. And uh, the last was the hearth, where we're exploring a structural uh, system that allows us to use uh, cedar wood, which doesn't rot, with mixed with the mud to create structural walls but also began to print furniture and to create an environment of a hearth that has a fireplace to create a place for gathering. And so program begins to be the next element of research that we're exploring. And so just to take you on a little walk of our new lab, which is a lab that doesn't have any walls where we can explore much larger scales where the material resources are, are vast and the, the landscape is vast, we're printing much larger objects. And this taller object is one of the larger ones we printed uh, several months ago, which uh, we call Oculus. And we're, the experiments we're, we're exploring here are one of trabiation, where we're stepping in the mud each time to produce something that is approaching a dome, although we don't enclose the dome or, or we're a little bit conservative in, in closing it up. Um, but also that trabiation to make an, an opening in the structure, like a door without any, any lintel. 
And so there you see this beautiful oculus with some of the patterning of the, the G-code clay uh, process, which improves the structural capacity of the, the, um, the object. And then in robotics, you often have a fourth axis where the robot moves back and forth. And so in this case, we made a very lightweight and inexpensive fourth axis where we could pick up the robot and move it each time. So instead of printing and waiting for the mud to dry and then printing again, we're basically printing, moving the robot, printing, moving the robot. And so we can print much larger objects much faster. And so you can see uh, a little walkthrough through the process. There's the robot, this, this tractor is simply holding up the hose of the 3D printer, but it also allows us to excavate the earth uh, from an adjacent field. Uh, here you can see the 3D printer in action. Um, here you can see it going up quite quickly. We're exploring ideas of lintels, of connected uh, rooms together. Um, this is what it looks like in, the, in our new laboratory here with the cows in the background and the open sky. And this is what we call Casa Covida. It's a, a house that we built during the time of COVID in the time of isolation where we could still be productive out in the middle of uh, a very remote environment. Um, <clears throat> and this is, these are process shots of some of the interiors uh, after, the, after the printing process was done where we're, we're exploring ideas of fenestration, uh, how we can make um, openings that are calibrated within the G-code itself and laying down the lintels in that process. Uh, we could frame the environment in the sky. There's a sonic quality to these environments, thinking about what kind of, what kind of furnishings might we have in a house like this, um, a bath, uh, a bed, a seat. And so now I'm just gonna take you on a quick tour of Casa Covida. This is just a couple of, of weeks ago. Um, I'll just let you watch while I, you can see there's an ax where we're chopping wood because it has a hearth and two seats. We worked with local textile artists to develop some of the textiles. Here's the bath uh, in the bathing room. Here's the bed in the bedroom made of uh, sheep skins and the textiles that are made of uh, wool as well from, from lo a local textile artist who we collaborated with. Those, those, those pillowcases are actually the plan of the building itself. Uh, and this is just one week prior to that. So on this journey, um, with this desire to 3D print Earth at large scales that began in 2007, I think we're finally at a point where we're thinking about how we can take sustainable materials, local materials, and really think about the future of construction by learning from the last 10,000 years of construction. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for this uh, incredible presentation. It was uh, super awesome to just see the, uh, the research behind the work and um, the process uh, going from these uh, small, very delicate objects, uh, printing in different materials and, 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 and just kind of throwing the resolution out of the window and then scaling up and really trying to solve issues of um, environmental concerns uh political uh unrest and so on and so forth through your work it was it was super enlightening and i i'll start by uh asking the first question while our audience warms up a little bit i, I see some questions here in the q a box but um to me what was particularly interesting is that you really don't um i mean seeing the work uh from from its early beginnings to what it is now it seems like you are more focused on the materiality behind uh, what you can do with the technology and, and almost hacking the technology of 3D printing to produce something that would answer a particular question. 
And each time that question changes and, and the challenge changes with it, um, do you find a bit of uh, sort of uh, backlash from say clients or uh, the audience uh, where, where you, you, you tend to, for example, ignore issues like, you know, how uh, aesthetically pleasing is this object or how, uh, you know, uh, how refined is the finishing and so on. Do you think that there's a bit of a backlash when it comes to that? And, and, and how do you tend to go around it? Because clearly the, 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 the question in your work has been answered. Uh, but, you know, with, like any research project, there has to be some rough edges around it. And, um, uh, you know, I, for one, really love the character that that gives the work. Um, but how do you go around convincing the, the client or uh, and, and the audience in general that this, this is worthwhile? <laughs> um, I will say that one way we do that is that we do not work with clients. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All of this work is uh, work that we're interested in in developing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if someone wants to play with us, if someone wants to collaborate with us, and they are open-minded and willing, then we allow them into our world. Mm -hmm. But um, we have a certain dedication to our belief in the materials and the forms and processes that we're working on that we we are uncompromising about that. And it might sound a bit arrogant, but it's really about having a conviction um, that allows us to move quickly through a, a set of beliefs. Um, mm. And a set of beliefs that have a limited amount of resources. So I, I have certainly seen how um, companies have emerged over the course of a year or two and they're suddenly printing very large buildings using concrete but i think they're avoiding certain questions that for us are very important uh, and that is that we are at the precipice of an entirely new way of constructing and building the world around us mm. and yet we're falling into the same traps that we fell into at the dawn of the industrial revolution mm. and so if we're using this technology to 3D print plastic materials or concrete materials, I sort of feel that that's problematic and it's, it's working backwards and not forwards. And so for us, it's by looking backwards at some of the beautiful traditions of construction that were explored by taking local materials um, and pushing them forward is a, is a way to think about the future of construction. And so if there are clients that want to allow us to think about a new kind of future, then we're very happy to collaborate with them. But, um, I, you know, it, you're, in your question is embedded a, a really important question that we do think about a lot, which is that uh, in many countries, uh, building with earth, for example, would be seen as a building material of the poor mm -hmm. uh, and impoverished. And I think it'd be very hard to, um, for some to accept that kind of material quality, right? Every, everyone likes white plastic paint, it's easy to clean, or what is it? But the material of, of clay is actually extremely clean. We eat off of it every day, we drink out of it every day. And so I think there are, there, there are this is really a cultural question. When does, when does the culture catch up really to 10,000 years of material exploration that's become quite sophisticated? rather than reverting to what I think are very primitive construction systems of plastic and concrete, which we've only known about for a very short time in the time scale of, of civilization. Yeah, I think that, you know, I'm asking this question from my own personal experience. We started our studio two years ago and, you know, exactly as you mentioned, we, we have a lot of, because we are trying to work with emerging technologies and, and to put them in practice, uh, and, and basically answering the brief of a project given to us by a client because clients fund our studio. And we are constantly being faced by this friction that you know these clients are seeking these innovative technologies, but they think these technologies are the answer to all the, the problems, including that they're going to be uh, you know, presented by this building that is so well resolved uh, while the technology is only a few years old. 
So with some of the structures that we have built that are experimental, we, we work with them as experimental structures and we were trying to basically learn and, and push a certain uh, idea. Um, you know, it's inevitable that you would find some issues that, you know, maybe the material is, is not, uh, you know, like the, the surface finish is not uh, as you've expected it to be, or the tolerances is, are not quite there. And no matter how you try to resolve these issues, they will always be there because it is, you know, by nature, this is an experiment. Um, we found a lot of friction pushing back to our clients and convincing them that this is how the process should be. And, you know, the, the outcome is still beautiful with its flaws and imperfections. Uh, and, and I'm constantly asking myself, like trying to create this balance between how can we fund our uh, studio by getting more projects and by clients that end up being happy with our work and also doing work that is innovative or would keep us also curious to know more. Um, so I guess your answer sums it up. Basically, don't work with clients. <laughs> well, I, I think there's there may be a new model for working with clients. Uh, you know, architecture is has traditionally been a service industry. Um, and within that service industry, you are at the will of the client. And so a client usually isn't interested in, in um, innovation, right? A, a, client, a client wants something, they're interested in, in expense and how little money they're going to have to pay for the most that they want. Um, so, so innovation isn't always on the table. Um, they're also at the service of their own aesthetic whims. And so when one, has developed a new sensibility about aesthetics using technology and one has mastered that, for example, you and your studio and your group and you're thinking about certain issues and a client simply says, well, I don't, I don't like that. It's, it's, it's a very small uh, wrench in a much larger cog of innovation. And so I, I think a, a possible new model is simply thinking about how, and, and I recognize that there's a lot of challenge in the, challenges in this, but how models of innovation in, in research and design can advance forward and clients, uh, and maybe I wouldn't call them clients in this case, I would say participants can come into that world and they can be taken on the journey of, of that innovation uh, moving forward. And so that's my aspiration for not only myself, but you and everyone else who's doing innovative work in the world that uh, the that those who we would refer to as clients can simply join in on an incredible journey of possibility. Um, that's my hope. And, and you really showed us how there, there is a world of possibility out there if you really just let your hair down and, and try to you know, play basically with the technology, with the materials and so on. Uh, so thank you for that presentation once more. Um, we have a question here by Anonymous and, and May I remind our participants, you can ask questions through the Q&A box. We have a few more minutes with uh, Rael here. So uh, please uh, feel free to drop a question in the Q&A box and I'll read it out. Uh, Anonymous is asking, does the tire 3D printing maintain any of the properties of the rubber? Uh, well, it's quite rigid, it's, but we've experimented with ways that it can feel rubbery and soft. The tire itself isn't very rubbery, you know, it's, it's it's, it's rubbery given a certain force, right? The force of a car will make a small amount of, of flexibility in, in the tire. So just by, by holding it and pushing it doesn't have a lot of uh, flexibility, but we've experimented with some finishes that give it a kind of, I would say a, a, a rubber feel, uh, which is kind of nice. So that's, that's also just part of our material experiments. What is it, not only what does a material feel like, or smell like, uh, but what does it mean also? And so what, thinking about what does it mean to make something out of car tires? I mean, I think there are ecological ramifications to that, political ramifications, economic ramifications, but there are also sensorial ramifications. We're interested in, in all of that. Um, and and uh, yeah, so we're always exploring those kind of issues. I, th I think that was one of my favorite uh, experiments of what you showed today, actually, the rubber material produced by uh, tires, because we, we did something very similar. The manufacturer of, the, uh, of the, uh, these tiles that were 
sponsoring an Audi pavilion that we designed for Design Week here, uh, made this material for us, which was just a square rubber tire, a uh, tile that was made from uh, tires. And I actually, I used um, a similar image to what you've shown, uh, but adding to that, I think also one way of disposing these rubber tiles is to burn them, which is also very bad for the environment, aside from landfill. So um, it's really great to see that you can actually crush them by freezing them and then um, produce this material. So basically anything that is turned into powder could be 3D printed for right. my presentation, <laughs> including sugar and tea and... <laughs> Well, I, I think it's really a return to its origins, right? And anything that's powdered can be uh, reconstituted, but everything that we have around us, all the materials, glass, for example, become, comes from powder, comes from sand. Uh, steel comes from powder, it comes from ore and iron that's pulverized and then melted. And so there are always, I think, I think this, this parable about from dust to dust uh, is, is accurate within the context of architecture and materials. Architecture comes from dust and returns to dust. Absolutely. Uh, John Four Koalis, who I believe is joining uh, from the Philippines, is asking, what type of 3D printers were you using to experiment with different types of materials? The 3D printers in my area only handle PLA filament. Uh, yeah, well, much of the, many of the printers are, are binder jet printers, which have a very different process. And really 3D printer, the word 3D printer has become the catch-all for very different kinds of additive manufacturing tools. And so the binder jet printers are, are technically what was originally the, the 3D printer because they used a printhead to deposit water onto a powdered surface. And so those are the printers that we use for much of those material explorations. Of course, that large clay extruder we developed ourselves with the company 3D Potter. And so that uh, we kind of, um, that's a, a very new kind of printer, um, but also using old technologies. And then there's the plastic extruder printers. We, use SF. we love all of the kinds of printers actually, but binder jetting is the one that I think is most robust for material experimentation. And I mean, following up on John Ford's question, did you uh, experiment with different types of adhesives or glues? Um, you know, some of these glues could be harmful to the environment, despite that you are using recycled materials. Uh, did you try to use maybe organic glues or biodegradable glues? Yeah, all of our glues are, are non-toxic and edible. So a lot of those things like the Chardonnay grape skin, when that comes out of the printer, you can actually eat it. Uh, mm -hmm. the wood is, is non-toxic. Uh, often we coat the the surfaces with or, or impregnate them with a polymer, and that polymer that we use is made out of recycled materials as well. So recycled bamboo or sawdust um, are some of the materials that are used to create those polymers. So we we have this constant ethos about the materials that we're using and their impact on the environment and the story that that tells. That's incredible. And I remember actually the, um, the, the, the example you showed from uh, a collaboration with Matsis. Andrew did present that a couple of weeks back on Live Academy. Really, really nice uh, example uh, for sure of your work. Uh, Ronald, thank you so much um, for this incredible presentation. Thank you for taking time to uh, present your work here on Live Academy. I really appreciate the gesture and especially that it's really early over there in Colorado. I don't know if you're an early riser. You strike me as one, actually. You really I, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So this is just a, a regular day for you. So enjoy your day and uh, hope we catch up soon. Okay, thank you, Riyadh. Great to meet you. Take care.